<laughs> so I was actually a couple of years late, but I we we ended up being roommates oh, when cool. when I went back, and by then I was married and. Bill was a roommate too, so the three of us lived together. So when did you meet Bill? I met him at CDC. I met him a few months after I got there. Okay. I got introduced in the lobby of CDC by somebody else who was in who was taking you know one of the EIS training classes, Jean Washington, who's currently the dean of the medical school at Duke. No big deal. <laughs> At the time we were all young, I mean, we were early in our career, so. But anyway, yeah. So Jean and I, you know, we were seated at, in this EIS class based on last name. So Jean was in the row behind me, so we used to talk all the right. time in class and stuff. And what a small world, right? I mean, yeah, just, this yeah, is really it is. Lot. Public health is a very small world. It's much bigger now. But it's it still, it's then. still a small world. It is, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I and MCH. Is MCH smaller. is still like the way public health used to be. <laughs> well, I always laugh. You know, when I go to Amtrak, it's like a family reunion. Right? You just yeah, see right. everybody. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. right. I mean, I don't even yeah. people I don't even know we're gonna be there. Yeah. From yeah. you know previous lives, right? Mm -hmm. But it's just yeah, the yeah. Is still like that. So you can imagine a lot of public health was like that. This mm -hmm. was like in the eighties, right? Right. When um. Before there was this big expansion of schools and public health, there are now an enormous number of oh, there's, a of them. there's a ton of them, but at the time, right, there really were, there were these kind of couple powerhouse institutions mm -hmm. that were doing public health. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So everybody kind of knew everybody in those days. And a lot of people, not a lot, but there was a lot of people, some of the people who had gone through EIS then went to academic settings. Mm -hmm. And EIS really is, well, it's very clubby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So once an EIS officer, you know. Always an EIS yeah, officer. Yeah, so that was the thing. You could pick up the phone and call any, you know, I had my EIS alumni directory on my desk. And if I need anything, I could call it. Wow. You know, anybody who'd ever been an EIS officer and say, hey, do you, particularly, I did surveillance around influenza and um, um, non-polio enteroviruses. Okay. And which a lot of people didn't track at the time. So right. you were just like I could be, when I, you know, when if I needed to find something, you know, I could pick up the phone and call the former EIS officer who had my job before them. So it really was a small small group. That's incredible. That's just really you know, and yeah. to have, just to be able to have that kind of network too, right? Exactly. At the beginning of, of your career in this yeah. field is just, I mean, I don't think there's anything like that. I really don't think so. And, you know, I and mean, we were encouraged to do it. It was like, that's why, I guess that's the way fraternities work. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, these are your buddies. You call them if you need right, something, right, and they're right. there for you. So, They'll see yeah. that ring and they know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so you, so, um, so Jean introduced you and Bill at CDC, and so when you went up to Boston, for this MPH program up at Harvard, Bill followed you. Yeah, we had just gotten married. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, we've been married for about a year. We mm. went to the MPH program. So, you know, and, and Bill actually, Bill was in the division of STDs. At the time, his boss was Ward Cates. I don't know if you know Ward mm -hmm. Cates. Yeah, yeah that, that Ward Cates. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, Ward said, okay, Bill, you can spend half your time at Harvard if you go learn how to do meta-analysis. He was a biostatistician oh, okay. in, in, in STD, so they, he got some support from Ward to go and learn. Meta-analysis was just sort of emerging as this. Right, right. Well, and you finally were at a place where, like, you had enough studies in a substantive area to say, okay, how do we make sense of this, mm -hmm. right? And you mm -hmm. needed that. Right. So it was very easy for him. He walked into the biostat department and he said, Hi, I'm, I'm from CDC. <laughs> <laughs> and they gave him an office and an like, ah! appointment. You know, right. like, so he was in the biostat department while I was doing my NPH. And you were like, yeah. I came here to get this. Okay. <laughs> right. You start rolling and walking a faculty. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, 
that's why I said it was a fun year, because we got to meet a lot of um, people, you know, who were in graduate school at Harvard, and like got to know faculty people, and um, I really enjoyed my classmates in the MPH program. At that time, about half the class, more than half the class at Harvard was, were primarily practicing MDs or okay. public health people, either from the U.S. or from other parts of the world. So it was, it was wow. like a very interesting kind of Yeah, and a really family. international group, right? Yeah. And it turns out one of the more serious students in my class was a woman by the name of Michelle Williams who is now the dean of the Harvard School of Public Health. I mean, this woman has this amazing career. I knew her when she was just like a year or two out of college. And I, and I sometimes I'd sit next to her, and she was just so serious and happy and final stat. And I thought, wow, she is intense. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so she, she went on to have a very illustrious academic Right, career. but you knew her when. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we kept it. And she did reproductive epi. Okay. So, and she was at Washington University in right. Seattle. So, you know, we kept in touch from time to time over the years. Mm. Yeah. Right, and similarly, Greg kind of ended up on kind of parallel, somewhat parallel tracks. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. yeah, so she became chair of the epi department at Harvard. <laughs> she became dean. <laughs> Wow, Michelle. Oh, Michelle. I was right. She was intense. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that funny sometimes when you like meet somebody and you know, and then kind of years later it, it plays out. And you're like, mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of kind of seen that coming. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I like watching you guys. You know, I, get, I have some, you know, ability to discern. <laughs> I don't know exactly where you're going to end up, but you're going to end up someplace really special. That's, yes. I think that's one of the fun things about getting to be, you know, in, in academia, right, is that you do, you get to see students come through. And yes. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is one of, one of the most fun things about it. working with students and sort of seeing the growth and the direction that people have taken and, and seeing their passions grow. You know, in public health, you have to be passionate. Yeah. There's yeah, no you hold your mind. Mind. <laughs> <laughs> So it's got to be something that you just love, 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 love. Yeah. yeah. And that's what makes it worthwhile. You know, and it's funny to hear you say that because, and to hear you say that, you know, you started out just really passionate about neonatology, right? And, and Rice and was kind of what brought you into public health. Because I remember, I mean, whatever, as I was starting to figure out this whole public health thing, you know, I've read so many of your publications about SIDS and about infant mortality, mm -hmm. right? And well, and to mm -hmm. and to see like, oh, you know that that really was what you have been passionate about, yeah, throughout your career, right? Like yeah. that you really found what it was that made your heart sing mm -hmm. to be able to dedicate your life's work to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I did other things. I mean, the first, um, I don't know, maybe six years from EIS and, and three or four years after that. I was in environmental health. Really? Actually. I was in the chronic disease division doing environmental health work. Oh, that's so unexpected. I did, <laughs> yeah. And actually when I went to do my MPH, I was doing it in environmental epidemiology. And um, okay, so here's another little yeah, yeah. tidbit. Sorry. I was, I was in a class doing work on infant mortality, but what happened was um, two things happened. Um, I came back to Atlanta, I guess, over the Christmas vacation or something, and went to talk to my grad chief, and I was saying, yeah, I'm learning a lot. Well, I, you know, I, was, I still was learning stuff. I was learning environment, more environmental health stuff, even though I knew a lot at the time. And I told my grad chief, I, I think I want to apply for a section position in the branch, you know, because I'm taking all these environmental epi courses and I'm ready to take on some more responsibility. And um, he looked at me and said, oh no, I don't think so. <laughs> I thought, what? <laughs> also, to be that, that direct, right? <laughs> of course, it was illegal. Can you imagine somebody, when you're wow. interviewing with that, you know, somebody who's not supposed to discourage you. Right. I don't know what was in his head at the time, and I thought, oh, that's very unusual that he thinks that I 
and not the right stuff. <laughs> right. I mean, what, what must have been going through your head with all of that? I was quite angry. And so it just so happened that during that same time, I had gotten a call from people in the Division of Reproductive Health. And they called and said, um, we are going to be setting up a new unit on infant mortality. And given your background, pediatrics, and I did, you know, your work, right. previous work, and I'd also did this amazingly wonderful investigation in Pakistan with disease detective on environmental exposure and poisoning. Mm. So anyway, they said, would you be interested in coming to interview with us for a position in reproductive health? We know you're at Harvard, but you'll be coming back. So I thought, yes, I'm going to go <laughs> interview with these people. If you don't want my brother, it's other people to <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> so, I went back to Harvard second semester and switched some of my courses mm -hmm. so that I took more related to MCH rather than environmental epi and took, you know came back into this new job in reproductive wow. health. And that's when I really started writing a lot about the infant mortality stuff. Okay. Yes. But that was a great fit, you know. So. I mean, I'm, I'm like, you know, infuriated on your behalf, however many years later that he said that. Yeah, but yeah. And at the same time, I'm so happy because but, we, you we know, got chance to. But that also tells you a little bit about what the culture of CBC was like. There were golden boys there. Mm. You know, they got handed positions. And everybody loved them. And I was, I was like, nobody paying attention to me. <laughs> I really felt that inside. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I didn't know whether what I was doing was what you call good work, because you know, I never got any feedback, you know. It just went into the void. But there you are at Harvard, and they're funding you to be at Harvard to get this oh, MPH, well, so was, clearly, clearly... Yeah, they, they encouraged you know. me. Harvard said, don't you want to stay and do a PhD? And I thought, no, I, I, I had, had enough of academics by then. I didn't want to get back out in the field. Yeah, but um, CDC was, was not, a, you know, a, it was a tough place to be, you know, because... When I was there, there weren't a whole lot of women in that you could see moving up the ladder. Now it's right. great, you know, but there were just probably a dozen of us that had gone through EIS and were doing well, you know, and, and trying but to just, decide, you know, develop our own path in terms of research interests and stuff. Right. And most of us didn't get discouraged, you know, it was just an uphill battle. Particularly for me, because I was black, you know, I was only a black person in the staff at that point. Mm -hmm. From the EIS. I mean, there are, right. like, there are other scientists there, but... Right, and so you're just seeing all these other people that you went through the service with moving up the ranks, and it's right. like, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. So I have a bunch of, a little, a few of those little stories mm -hmm. to tell, but for the most part, I enjoyed the work so much, it was worth it. Right. You know, it's clearly... And I, and I mean, the infant mortality team was clearly, clearly a good fit. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, there, I think three or four of us were recruited. One person was an obstetrician gynecologist who had been in Division of Reproductive Health Board. Oh, Bert was there. I mean, there were, yeah, there were yeah, yeah. other things going on in the right, Division of Reproductive right. Health, but there had not been a focus on infant mortality until right. that point, and so they recruited about two That's or three wild. Months. That's wild to think. I mean, was CDC like just counting infant deaths but not doing anything, or just not even counting? I don't know. Well, <laughs> National Center for Health Statistics was, was the, you know, right, has always right. been responsible for counting infant deaths and those statistics. And at that point, reproductive health was primarily about family planning right. and abortion surveillance, and um, there was a lot of good work being done. They, they did um, quite a few studies looking at um, risk factors for women who were taking birth control, any kind of sterilization birth control, right. but it was primarily, truly on the reproductive side of, okay. of issues. And so this new push to infant mortality was what was new. Is that, um, so when we got there, we started working much more closely with the National Center for Health Statistics okay. to look at vital statistics data and get linked birth and death records. That was one of the early things right. that we worked on. And setting up a PRAMS, that was part of that whole development. Right, right. so you, you were there right at the beginning of all yeah. of this. Yeah, I was there 
trying to get the money to do it. <laughs> I was, you know, my first year or two, my, uh, there was, actually, it's the George Bush, the first Bush right. president, developed an inf in, in, interest in infant mortality. And so he actually put together, oh, this is so funny too. This is why public health is small. Bill Roper was a fellow at the White House. And Bill Roper took the assignment to look at domestic infant mortality. Mm -hmm. So he put together um, a committee or a commission with the head, with representatives from Health and Human Services and Education and Housing. I mean, all of the wow. major cabinet people were asked to send representatives to look at the issue of infant mortality. And the stimulus for it was actually that the U.S. ranking was dropping. Huh. And Japan had been getting better and better. It was like number two in infant mortality. Right. And around that time, I think the U.S. was number 15, and everybody was right. very concerned. And it was politically, it was at a time when Japan was undergoing this wonderful economic boom. And right, and the U.S. had a lot of feelings about that. Yes, yeah, so there was this <laughs> jealousy and competition. And so, you know, Bush said, we've got to fight, figure out what's going on. Huh. So we convened this committee. And the only people that really ever took it that seriously were um, people from the Department of Education and from Health and Human Services mm -hmm. and maybe one other cabinet position. So all of the big, you know, the high-level managers came to the first meeting and they brought their underlings. I was the underling at the time. <laughs> I just started. No, that's right. right. You, know, it was, yeah. you know, I was the one that sat against the wall while everybody was sitting around the table and they were planning on strategies and what they were going to do and they needed data. <laughs> Conveniently. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how, you know, I got first involved in, in generating a lot of the information and the data and then they needed um, solutions. And this was a Republican administration, so they said, we are not going to put a whole lot of money in this, but we want you to put your heads together and come up with some new ways of right. doing things. Read my lips, no new taxes, so come up right. with something with exactly. what you got. Right? Exactly. <laughs> so there were a small, a handful of us, primarily from HHS, or from HRSA, and NIH, and CDC, who clearly, we were the ones who clearly had the biggest mm -hmm. stake in it. And so all of the relatively junior level people worked with our senior people, but we were the grunts. Right. We did all the work, which meant I flew to D.C. almost every two weeks to a meeting or to plan. And um, the three agencies got together and came up with a list of things that they thought might be helpful. Mm and then uh, presented them. And, you know, we got some endorsement from the Department of Education. HIV tr education was a big thing there, right. too, okay. to prevent it from spreading to Right, right, because you know, AZT wasn't on the market yet. You, prevention was the only option. Yeah, and, and also because of CDC's role, preventing it in high school and in, in adolescents and young right. adults was a big issue, too. So part of what CDC did while we were up there was lobby for more, more money for the Division of Adolescent Health so that they could start doing HIV education and prevention with school systems. In the Bush and years. that was the pre-ad health stage. A lot of ad health. Right. Um, it, it evolved into getting funding and support for ad health I so that you could understand health behaviors among adolescents. HIV was funded a lot of the early stuff. I had no idea. I just had no idea. Yeah, most people don't, but you know, it's sort of like, that's where the money was, so obviously. Right. I mean, Part of the strategy is like, well, we can't have HIV in kids, so give us some money so we can work on wow. very early prevention. Wow. So, but anyway, okay. that's sort of an aside. So, um, we came up with like maybe three or four recommendations about what to do to do a better job with infant mortality. And it turned out so, sort of like each agency got a piece of the action. Mm -hmm. And Hearst's piece of the action was um, Healthy Start, right. community-based interventions to prevent infant mortality. And um, 
I forget, NIH, all this guy, everything. Doesn't matter what. I mean, you know, I shouldn't say it like that. I think they got funding for SIDS. Um, and CDC and the National Center for Health Statistics got funding to do a better job of monitoring health behaviors, and that's how PRAMS evolved. So that we could understand what was going on with pregnant women huh. during, you know, what were the risk factors that led to poor infant outcomes, low birth weight, and infant mortality. And there was funding for to improve vital records so that you could link infant death records with birth records and look at risk factors right. within issues around birth that led to deaths. And there was funding for the health disparities. Which, right, right. And there was funding for maternal and child health epidemiology to train more people. Mm -hmm. And that, that was shared between CDC and HRSA. So basically, what I got out of being there, being the scut person, <laughs> was I got to head up the, the part on health disparities and to mm -hmm. develop the MCH Happy program with my branch chief. So, so the next few years were just really exciting because once again we got funding and we spent several years, a year sort of like looking at the literature because, mm -hmm. you know, there was nothing to tell us anything useful about what was causing health disparities. Right. So we decided to do multidisciplinary search and we came up with this, so this concept of importance of stress and looking at the environment, where, whereas before all of the infant mortality was focused on a medical model. Right. Right. And we want to expand beyond that. And once again, I spent a lot of time traveling, 